So Kate Forbes is going to stand to be SNP leader and therefore First Minister. So I'm going to give some thoughts on that. I'm giving these thoughts as a political opponent. Obviously, Kate Forbes says vote SNP. I say vote Scottish Family Party. But I'll try and be fair and factual and gracious in what I've got to say. I mean, for a start, people have been saying it's really unfair the way Kate Forbes has been attacked because she's a Christian. I would just say that is not true. Kate Forbes has not been attacked because she's a Christian. People might say, oh, it's not just because she's a Christian. It's because she's in the Free Church of Scotland. Kate Forbes has not been attacked because she's a member of the Free Church of Scotland. Ian Blackford, I don't know if he still is, but he certainly was a member of the Free Church of Scotland. But he was fine. Why was he fine? Because everyone knew he didn't actually believe what the Free Church of Scotland believed. Look at Ross Greer, the foul-mouthed green MSP who is incredibly hostile to lots of aspects of traditional Christian teaching. No one objects to the fact that he puts Christian on his Twitter description. Monica Lennon, a Catholic. No one minds because she's really keen on abortion. Hamza Yousaf. No one minds that he's a Muslim. Why is that? Well, because he doesn't actually believe traditional Muslim beliefs. He doesn't have traditional Muslim values. So that's why Kate Forbes has been treated, different, been treated differently because people do actually think she believes the teachings of the Free Church of Scotland of the traditional Christian churches, in other words. Now, when Kate Forbes has spoken about her faith, I've quite often heard her saying things along the lines of, I'm a Christian, and that leads me to want to make the world a better place to help people, call me into politics, etc., etc. Now, uh, I've got no problem with that. I've said the same things as well. The first chapter of my book is along those lines, so that's uh, absolutely fine. But that's entirely uncontroversial. Nobody minds that. But when Kate speaks about her faith, she does sound like she really believes it. She speaks about the Christian gospel, not just about, you know, being nice and caring and love for universal brotherhood of mankind or whatever. Um, so people think she does really uh, believe it. Now, what evidence have they got for that? Well, it's actually quite slim. I mean, she signed a letter urging the government to not rush the gender recognition reform bill. So not saying she disagreed with it, just saying don't rush it. But the time she was a government minister, she wasn't allowed to disagree with this. But there was that tiny thing. But in terms of a view on homosexual sex, I mean, one might assume that her view is she thinks it's immoral. But I've never, I don't think she's ever made any public comment on that at all. Uh, a line in a prayer at the National Prayer Breakfast, this is years and years ago now, uh, she mentioned something about protecting the unborn. And that made a little uh, a news story here and there. But as far as I'm aware from Kate Forbes, that is it. So just that one prayer mentioning the unborn, that's it for six years as, as an MSP. That's all she said. Now, some people have been saying as well, you know, how come you know, John Mason gets it in the neck for his Christian values, but Kate Forbes, they seem to let her off a bit. Is it that they pick on John because he's, he's a man? Then there's other people saying people picking up on Kate Forbes' Christian faith is misogyny. I mean, that just makes no sense. So how come John gets it in the neck Kate, not so much. Is it that Kate's got a nicer smile? Well, maybe, maybe that helps. But the main factor is that John Mason repeatedly speaks about his Christian values. For example, he's the only MSP I've ever heard standing up in the Scottish Parliament talking about defending the unborn. He's the only one. Um, so lots of commentators are saying, you know, Kate Forbes is a bold Christian. I, I, I don't think that's justified. I don't think that description is justified at all. I think Kate Forbes has said next to nothing about the controversial aspects of her faith. Just go a little tangent here for a minute. It's interesting. People throw at the Scottish Family Party. You're a Christian party. They'll throw to Kate Forbes. You know, you, there's these Christian values. Now, I mean, Kate Forbes' views and the Family Party views probably overlap very significantly, I would suggest. And people know that that's Christian values. But if you look at the mainstream churches, look at the Church of Scotland, look at the Church of England, look at the Episcopal Church, their values are not really in line with what I'm imagining Kate believes and the Scottish Family Party believes. And yet the general public and commentators, they still call traditional Christian teaching Christianity. So what they think of the mainstream churches, I don't know. They obviously just don't regard those as, as Christian. But anyway, let's carry on thinking about Kate Forbes. Let's imagine that she wins the contest, becomes First Minister. A lot of her personal viewpoints, if they were made into SNP policy, that would be political suicide for them. So, for example, if she tried to make the SNP pro-life or to reject a conversion therapy ban or the LGBT indoctrination school, whatever, 
the SNP would be getting attacked by the Conservatives for not being progressive enough. And in terms of public opinion, the numbers wouldn't add up. The SNP is trying to get you know, up to 50% of the vote, but there's not 50% of people who agree on those points. So a lot of Kate's opinions, if they were enacted in SNP policy, just would not work. So maybe Kate will try this with Jacob Rees-Mogg approach. So Jacob Rees-Mogg will speak quite passionately uh, about uh, abortion, but then he also says, that's just my view, and don't worry, I'm not going to try and change the law. Now, I've got a problem with that. I just That, that just doesn't make any sense uh, at all. Now, with something like same-sex marriage, perhaps someone could say, okay, I think it's wrong, but in our society as it is, I think it, it should be allowed uh, because, you know, it's not sort of doing direct harm to people. Other people might say they think it does do a lot of harm uh, to society. But something like abortion, how can you possibly say abortion is the killing of an innocent human being, but I don't want to inv impose my views on anyone? I mean, if people want to do it, then that's fine. I obviously don't want to stand in their way because that would be improper of me. Killing humans in the womb, that's bad, but don't worry about it. I'm going to let it carry on. It's not really a problem for me. I just think that's incoherent. Uh, the other thing I'd say um, to Kate, I think when it came to the gender recognition reform, I think if Kate had been in the government, she might well have refused to vote for it and would have resigned. But I would suggest that's an instance of currency bias. In other words, looking at the current hot topic and drawing your red line there. But what about all the existing policies? I think they're equally important. It shouldn't in politics. It shouldn't just be a matter of looking what's coming up next and taking a stand as a matter of principle on that. You've got to look at the whole uh, raft of existing policies of a party and decide whether a red line should be in the whole lot of them. And what will happen during the leadership campaign uh, maybe if she's first minister as well, if she gets uh, elected, if people will put her on the spot about her values. I mean, the classic question is, do you think homosexual sex is immoral? Do you think abortion ought to be re restricted, legally restricted in Scotland? Now, one option Kate would have there to use every IQ point she can muster to find the cleverest way possible to not answer the question, to say something that doesn't quite answer it, to dodge it one way or another. I mean, ultimately, if you refuse to answer a question, the interview doesn't go on infinitely, but eventually the interviewer gives up uh, and moves on. So politicians can always refuse uh, to answer. Now, I think if there was some sort of hustings event, or let's say we were both, Kate and I were on question time or something, uh, then I would be sitting there really wanting questions about these key moral topics. And I think Kate would be sitting there thinking, oh no, I hope no one asks about these key moral topics. Well, that's quite interesting. Now, when Kate... Uh, was elected as an MSP. She was given a finance job quite early on. Now, I think the reason for that is for finance, you need someone who's quite bright, it's quite complicated. I think other government jobs are not really as intellectually demanding. So that's part of the reason Kate was put in finance. But the other reason was that the SNP, Nicholas Sturgeon, would know that Kate might have some socially conservative views. So put her in finance and she can't do any harm there. You don't put her in the Equality and Human Rights Committee. That would be a liability that would be disaster brewing for the SNP. So when you've got someone with socially conservative views, put them in a role where those views are going to have no impact at all. That's the normal strategy of the big uh, parties. Um, so throughout Kate's career, she's been quite protected from a lot of these debates because the area she's been focused on has been unrelated to them and in many ways uncontroversial. Now, Kate might claim that behind the scenes and the cabinet meetings, even though she hasn't been saying anything publicly on a lot of key moral issues, she's been saying something behind the scenes, exerting influence, I know, a little conversation uh, here and there. Now, my answer to that would be, has it made any difference? I mean, if Kate were to say, if it hadn't been for me, things would be even worse. The SNP's policies would have been even worse. I would say it's quite hard to imagine how they could have been even worse. So I'm not, that's not to say Kate might not have tried behind the scenes. I'm just saying from my perspective, looking at the policies of the Scottish government, the actions of the Scottish government, I say it's hard to see how they could have been worse, uh, which undermines any claim to have restrained them in any direction. Now, if Kate were to be First Minister, a significant amount of power and obviously a huge amount of opportunity to communicate uh, with the public. So would Kate be able to use the position just to start moving public opinion a little bit. Or alternatively, might some of the key moral issues be devalued by the fact that Kate's so willing to compromise on them and so unwilling to speak about them 
uh, clearly. Now, might it be that uh, Kate ends up modelling compromise and inaction and therefore becomes seen as a role model uh, for the, the way you're supposed to handle this sort of use? So, so the culture could build up. That if you're pro-life, you should be the sort of pro-lifer like Kate Forbes. She's the right sort of pro-lifer. OK, she believes it. But she doesn't talk about it and she doesn't try to do anything about it. I use the pro-life issue. I could use lots of others as well. So that's a danger that, that, uh, that she might be held up as a role model in that regard. And then people who do actually speak out and take action, they might be compared with Kate Forbes and they might be more vulnerable to, uh, to mistreatment on that basis. You know, because you're obviously the, the lunatic extreme because someone like Kate Forbes, she shows how it should be, uh, how it should be really done. When it comes to the SNP, I think a big question is when it comes to election time, do you stand before the electorate and say, please vote for a party that will continue, for example, a, a abortion? Um, so, I mean, Kate would obviously say yes, because that's what she's been saying for years and years. Uh, I would say that that's wrong. That's something that should be contrary to conscience. So Kate Forbes to become leader, she'll have to have a plan for securing independence. Will she have a plan to save the unborn? I, I would suggest not. Uh, definitely not. So Kate, will, as First Minister, would have to wrestle with her conscience on a lot of issues. Think about the conversion therapy ban that would result in mainstream Christian leaders being criminalised for doing their job, for presenting their faith to certain groups of people, certain types of people, for helping people who come to them asking for help on the basis of their shared faith. That will be criminalised. Now, I, I would be 99% certain that Kate actually thinks that's wrong. She doesn't think there should be a conversion therapy ban like that. But let's say she said, OK, you know, let's, let's not do this. Let's back off from this. Dear, oh dear, what would happen? The, it's the Conservative Party policy to have a conversion therapy ban. Is it really feasible that the SNP could be more socially conservative than the Conservative Party? Uh, with the, the media would be on the case. I, I think it's almost impossible to imagine how Kate, even as First Minister, could stop something like that, could stand in the way of it. Similarly with uh, LGBT indoctrination in schools, similarly with buffer zones around abortion clinics. I don't see, even as First Minister, I don't see how she could exert positive influence on those areas. The problem, as I see it, is that supporting the SNP involves sort of promoting evil, even if you think that's the means that, by which you're going to, to fight it. Because by remaining in the SNP, by urging people to vote SNP, by leading the SNP with his current policies, uh, then Kate will be communicating that all these current policies are not a deal breaker for me. What I would say is a matter of conscience. Some of them are such grave issues that they ought to be. So for Kate and I, a fundamental disagreement is, is on which party to join. So Kate's joined the SNP and now faces very, very difficult challenges on the road ahead. I mean, how it's going to work out, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But that, that's the fundamental difference is in which party uh, to join. Now, I say throughout her career as an MSP, Kate has she sort of positioned herself a little bit above the cut and thrust of political debate. I mean, I can't imagine her like, spitting out Westminster uh, the way Nicola Sturgeon regularly did. Now, will Kate be able to sustain that as First Minister? Well, it's probably easier to do that as First Minister in the government because people are challenging you and you can be trying to be saying, oh, you know, let, let's not argue over this. Let, let's, uh, you know, let, let's just be a bit more moderate and temperate. If, if you're the government, if you're the first minister, maybe it is e easier to sustain that. I, I would say the, uh, the the sort of tone and persona Kate's maintained so far uh, couldn't be sustained as an opposition politician, where you, you've just got to lay into the government at every opportunity and criticise them in, in no uncertain terms. But maybe her the way she's sort of risen above the no normal cut and thrust of politics, maybe that will stand her in good stead as a first minister if she's elected. We shall see. Now, Jordan Peterson talks about something quite interesting, which I noticed myself as well. Sometimes you'll hear people with the idea that I'm going to keep my head down. I'm not going to say what I believe. I'm just going to you know, keep my head down, plain sailing. But then when I reach the top, that will be my opportunity to really make a difference. That's when I'm going to start speaking out. That's when the action comes. And uh, Jordan Peterson says, basically, when people say they're going to do that, it never happens. It never happens. I, mean, I would tend to think of Justin Welby. Remember when he was appointed Archbishop of Canterbury? I remember lots of Christians saying, oh, this is fantastic. You know, he's an evangelical. This is going to be, this is going to transform the Church of England. You just wait what 
and see what Justin Welby does. And look what he has done. Total compromise, wishy-washy, absolutely hopeless. When the 2016 intake of MSPs uh, went into the parliament, there were Christians saying, oh, this is absolutely fantastic. There's so many Christians in the parliament now. There's so many Christian MSPs. You just wait and see what difference this is going to make. Well, did it make much difference? No, no, it didn't. I tend to believe if you're in the habit of compromising, keeping your head down, choosing silence, or people, the other way of describing it would be they call it wisdom or whatever, or picking your battles, it amounts to the same thing. If you're in that habit, I think it's very hard to break it when you get into, into a position where there's even more at stake, even more at stake. Because in politics, generally, you know, it's a wealth, status, popularity. They go along with toeing the line, keeping your head down, compromising. Uh, and so that there's a lot of momentum that can build up in that direction. And I would suggest it's probably very difficult for someone to break out of that once they're in the habit of it and start speaking and acting more clearly on the basis of, of controversial opinions. I always remember when I went and stood in the election, the first time I stood in an election for the Scottish Family Party back in 2019 in Ross Sky and Lock Harbour. I'd speak to a lot of people, um, yeah, quite, quite often Christians, and I'd talk about what the SNP's doing, and they'd say, it's terrible, isn't it? Absolutely terrible what the government's doing. We can't believe it. It's really terrible. Then they'd say, but do you know Kate Forbes? She's really nice, isn't she? And I would, I didn't want to argue with them, but what I did want to say is, does that make any difference though? Does that make the SNP's policies any less bad? Does that make them any less evil in some aspects? Now, I don't think anyone would would actually try and present that as a logical case because Kate Forbes is nice and talks about her faith. The SNP policies are not as evil. No one would actually say that. But in terms of people's emotional response, that seemed to be quite a powerful factor uh, within it. Because Kate's effectively accepted an alliance with people within the SNP and within the Greens, many of whom wouldn't accept her as leader. So Kate's been promoting and commending people within the SNP who ultimately are not willing to reciprocate it. We'll see it. We'll see how that response turns out. There's already some people within the SNP saying, if Kate Forbes becomes leader, then, then you know, that's it. I, I'm out. I can't work with her because of her views. Now, I think if I was Kate Forbes, I'd be tempted to see a hand of providence in my career so far. Can we look at Kate? I mean, she found herself as a uh, finance secretary because her predecessor, who was a real LGBT campaigner, I mean, Derek Mackay said that the same-sex marriage debate in the Scottish Parliament inspired him to abandon his family and to uh, go off and have a relationship with a man instead. And then he was trying to chat up a schoolboy. Uh, off he went. And then that was Kate Forbes' opportunity. Now, from Kate's point of view, how perfect no one was really in the mood to say to her, we're not sure about your you know, pro-LGBT credentials under those circumstances, really. Then if she succeeds Nicola Sturgeon, again, it's the perfect opportunity in a sense, because there's not going to be many people who are going to be saying, you know, we're a bit dubious about your pro-LGBT credentials here. How, you know, looking at what's just happened to Nicola Sturgeon. People still will, but it will just be restrained a bit by recent history. And also she's facing a very weak field of candidates. So if I was Kate, I would feel maybe things were opening up in a providential fashion. But I don't know. I don't know. So how might it turn out if Kate becomes First Minister? Possible outcomes. Number one, the Tim Farron situation. Tim Farron became leader of the Lib Dems, evangelical Christian. Uh, interviewers pressed him and pressed him and pressed him. Do you think homosexual sex is immoral? Eventually he said no. Later on he apologised and said basically he lied because um, he actually does think that. Um, so I really hope Kate doesn't end up in that sort of situation. I, I, I think that would be, yeah, it would be a disaster for her. It would be a disaster more broadly uh, as well. So I, I really hope that that doesn't happen. Possibility number two, that Kate never talks about her controversial opinions. She dodges every question. She never acts on them as first minister. I think that raises some serious integrity uh, issues. I think a, a downside with that would be it would diffuse the Christian prophetic voice in Scotland. Because Christians who are saying, look at what the government's doing, it's really evil. The response will tend to be, oh, but it's Kate Forbes is a Christian. So whatever the Scottish government does, it will sort of have a Christian veneer on it because Kate Forbes is a Christian. So there's a potential uh, for that being a negative thing. 
I would suggest. I mean, outcome number three possibility, maybe from her influence within the government, she could just slow down so-called progress. So the next bad ideas the SNP has, she would just restrain them a little bit, slow them down a little bit, maybe take some of the worst um, edges off them. Uh, maybe within society in general, she could just diffuse some of the hostility towards traditional Christian values, just possibly, um, and their possible pluses. But the downside there is alongside that, she has to be seen as endorsing every other aspect of SNP policy, which uh, in my view involves endorsing some evils uh, as well. So there's a balance there. Could that balance tip in the overall positive direction? I'm inclined to think it can't. Uh, Kate, I would imagine, would say that she thinks it can. But, but that's our fundamental difference. That's why she's in the SNP, and that's why I'm, I'm in the Scottish Family Party. Right, option number four. Kate actually does try and push for some positive changes to legislation, even, even a little bit. But that would result in absolute warfare, and I can't see how it could, could succeed, because public opinion wouldn't be behind it, the media wouldn't be behind it, every profession, the establishment wouldn't be behind it. It's hard to see uh, how she could do that, even a little bit. If, if, say, she was going to think about, say, rolling back the uh, LGBT indoctrination in schools, I just cannot imagine how that could work out for her. But uh, let's see. So if Kate Forbes does become the First Minister, she's got real challenges ahead. I mean, very, very difficult situation she will be finding herself in. And I suggest in terms of her Christian values, the best way you can support her in that role is to support the Scottish Family Party. Because within the SNP, Kate, if Kate Forbes is saying, look, I think maybe we should look at this policy. And everyone around the table says, that's really stupid. No one votes, no one's vote is determined by that policy. It's a vote loser, but it's not going to win us any votes. Then if Kate can say, well, actually, look at the number of people who do vote according to this issue. We're losing votes over this issue. We need to be careful about that. So the more people support the Scottish Family Party, the stronger Kate Forbes's position within the Scottish government in order to put forward policies based on her specifically Christian values. So that, that's the future uh, for Kate. Few, few options, but I would offer another option as well. You know, maybe take another couple of years off while, while your baby's very young. Uh, leave the SNP during the Scottish Family Party. Now, I understand that there's a vacancy for the Deputy Treasurer of our Dingwall East branch at the moment, and you'd be very welcome to apply. And progress up the ranks through these in the Scottish Family Party can be very rapid. Uh, you could then stand as an MSP in the Highlands and Islands uh, on the regional list, and you would win. You would become an MSP again. So then, Kate, you would be an MSP, and you could go and speak in the Parliament and at the end of every day, you can put your head on the pillow, knowing that you've spoken the truth. You've opposed evil, you've not condoned it, you've spoken to a wider public, you've been straightforward and clear and unashamed about your beliefs, and that would really help shift public opinion. It would help contribute to a real breakthrough for the Scottish Family Party as well. So within the Scottish Family Party, we'd be saying to you, you know, let's get on with the job, protecting children from corruption, saving the unborn, establishing a healthy culture, strong families, as well as addressing all of the other issues that Scotland faces. Now, whichever of those options you choose, however it goes, you have our best wishes as you embark on what I think is going to be a very difficult path.